Hello and welcome back to Central Portugal where we've been living off-grid on solar here for over a year now, almost 18 months actually. And we've had a lot of questions about our solar setup, the equipment, how it suits our lifestyle and how we're planning to use it in the future going forward as we renovate our house, which you may just be able to see in the background. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Good morning. So it looks like you're weeding the solar panels. <laughs> they, uh, number one, they need a wash. <laughs> And then there was some stuff here that was casting a shadow, so I thought I'd fix it while we're here. Let's talk about why we're talking about this first. So getting power into the house is the next big thing. It's the last service that we have remaining. And so that's what we'll be moving on to very shortly. We need to relocate our panels and then we need to get all the kit that's in our shed down to the house. So we thought before we start moving anything, we talk you through what we have and what the future plans are. So you kind of got an idea of where we're going. So while we're out here, let's start by talking about the panels. We've got six of them. Each of them are 400 watts, which gives us a total of 2.4 kilowatts that we can harvest from the sun at any one time. That's like a maximum. It doesn't always do that. In fact, let's have a look and see what it's doing at the moment. It is 8.45 in the morning. And we are currently generating almost 600 watts of power, so not using the full capacity at this time of day. But by the middle of the day, the sun will be beaming down on all these panels and generating lots and lots of electricity for us. So we've had these panels set up here for the last 18 months or so, and they've been working great for us. This is a temporary setup. We are going to be moving things around, and we'll show you some of that a little bit later on. But something that is quite interesting is this whole off-grid setup that we had here temporarily while we were living in the tent is going to be redeployed to the house and the whole house is going to remain on off-grid solar power as the only source of electricity when we eventually move in there, although who knows when that's going to be. So there's not much more to say out here. We've got a bunch of panels and they're wired back to a bunch of equipment inside the shed. Let's go inside and take a look at all the other stuff that makes this system work. Uh, there was a Portuguese company called Solarshop.pt who helped us design and size all of this equipment and they took all our requirements and worked out what we needed with scalability in mind because this is going to be ported to be used in the house and obviously we're going to have a lot more appliances when we have finished building our house so they helped us to work out well what could we get that would work for us now and what would then be able to we could add to the same setup to basically beef it up for the house so that's what we've ended up with they were really really helpful guy communicated with them in english which was super helpful um, and we've gone back to them multiple times. They also helped us to size a generator and they've been helping us with how we're going to do our final setup because we've just started planning that uh, when we relocate our panels and we relocate all this gear down towards the house, which is coming a little bit later this year. Yeah, so all the gear is from a company called Victron Energy and they've got lots of great information. They've even got their own YouTube channel and I think it was watching some of their videos about larger homes that have a off-grid solar install that actually let us know that that was an option. There's a lot of content out there about people doing solar installs for things like camper vans, boats, other kind of small scale, small off-grid setups. But we wanted to be able to run our entire house off of solar panels and batteries, which we'll talk about in a second. And it was seeing some of the content and some of the equipment from Victron that allowed us to see that that was possible, which was really cool. And so the, the word off-grid is actually quite important here because it is a very specific set of tools and equipment and setup that is kind of unique in that we are not connected to the main electricity grid. The energy that we capture from the panels is not fed back to the grid because these days there is not much benefit to doing that. So here in Portugal, even if you feed back to the grid, you don't get any payback. Those contracts were finished a couple of years ago and so there's absolutely no benefit to, to being connected to the grid if you want to sell back. It's useful if you want to use the grid as your backup solution or mm -hmm. you, you just want to use the solar power in the day and not at night and want to use the grid overnight. Um, but that's not the situation that we wanted for ourselves. And there's lots of reasons why we wanted to stay off grid. That's just our decision. It doesn't suit everyone. It suits us. That's absolutely right. And so what that means is when the sun goes away, 
either because it's nighttime or because it's cloudy or stormy or something like that, we aren't bringing in any energy from the sun. So we have to supplement our system with batteries. And so we've got a rack of four Pylon Tech batteries. They are 2.4 kilowatt hours of storage each, which gives us a total of just under 10 kilowatt hours of storage, about 9.6. And so that is our source of energy or power overnight or when the sun goes behind a cloud. And that amount of battery power has been fine for our current usage. Um, all the typical things that you would find in a normal home, kettles, toasters, microwaves, fridges, we recently added another fridge and another freezer and, and it's been absolutely fine. We use about 30% of the battery overnight and it's then recharged usually by about 10 or 11 in the morning. So during the summer, no problems at all. During the winter, if we have consecutive gray days or lots of rain or something like that, it can get a bit tight. We're fine if there's like two days in a row, but if it pushes into three or more days, then things do get a bit tight in terms of the, uh, the remaining battery power. And so we have a generator to supplement that. It's a fairly small one, and we've literally only used it three times to kind of top up the batteries just enough to get us through uh, a gray day. So last winter, we weren't here for December and January. We stayed offsite in a rental. So we didn't do a full winter using the solar and I think even during that period the consecutive number of grey days was only there was only a couple of periods of two and three days so it probably would have been two or three more times that we had would have had to use the generator. So we do expect to have to beef up our battery storage when we move to the house because we will have a lot more appliances running. We will have an air source heat pump that will need power all the time. We're going to put mechanical ventilation in that will need some power. So we know that we're going to have to expand our system, both with batteries and with panels, but we knew that from the very beginning. But let's talk about how much we use, how much we generate, and what behaviours we've had to change, because that is one of the things that is most important when you go on solar, is you have to change the way you use electricity. So it is a bit pokey in here. Let's go outside and talk about some of that stuff and pull out some of the data from the very handy Victron app. Okay. Right. Well, that's good for solar, right? <laughs> so one of the things we definitely do now is all of the canning that we do and we have a, it's a microwave oven combo and so when we're using the oven setting it has a really high power usage. So we tend to try and only use those appliances when the sun is out so that we're not using the battery storage um, because if we do then we go well beyond the 30% overnight. Um, so we definitely only can during the day. The dehydrator, the same thing, only use it during the day. Obviously the power tools we use pretty much only during the day because we're only working <laughs> during the day. But, but they don't actually use that much energy because they only use here and there. Uh, well, the short... dehydrator and the canner. And oh no, the... I mean the power tools. Yeah, the power tools don't, though there's a couple of them that do. The big hammer drill definitely uses some power. I think in the future, we will move towards, so we're going to have a big induction set up. We will have our biggest meal in the middle of the day rather than cooking on the induction hob in the evening. And I know some friends that do the same thing. They cook while the sun is still out and so that they don't have to use the power in the evenings. Uh, same will happen with dishwashers, washing machines, etc. So any of those things that we know take quite some chunky power. Even at the moment when there's grey days, I don't use the washing machine. So yeah, it's just changing those behaviours so that you know that the appliance that you're using is using the sun rather than your battery storage. So when we lived back in London, we had a two bedroom flat and our average daily use of electricity was about 10 kilowatt hours. That's average across the whole year based on old utility bills. When we moved here and first put in the, the off-grid solar setup that we have, which we haven't changed or expanded over the last 18 months, we were averaging between three and four kilowatt hours. And that's just simply because we don't have as many appliances and as many things plugged in or turned on or being used throughout the day. Recently, we purchased an extra fridge and freezer because of all the produce that's coming out of the garden. And that has had an impact on our average daily use. Uh, we're now around five to six kilowatt hours per day. And this is one of the things about energy consumption that is kind of interesting and kind of tricky to work out. A lot of people think that big power tools or, or a, a, a microwave or a toaster or something like that that draws two kilowatts is gonna 
have a big impact on your use. But something like a kettle is only used for a minute to boil water to make a coffee or a tea or something like that. Whereas something like a fridge, which may only use 150 watts, 200 watts, is on for 24 hours a day. So it actually uses quite a lot. And so when we've added these two new appliances, that has had quite a significant increase in our daily average use. But just to give you a bit of an idea of what a typical day looks like at the moment, we can have a look at some of the data. I'll put it up on the screen as well so you can see it. So this is what we've got coming in right now. It's now 10 past nine in the morning. We're generating 800 watts of power. Our batteries are at 74% and we're currently only drawing 192 watts. And that's probably one of the fridges or the freezers and the compressor probably hasn't kicked on at the moment. In terms of the last 24 hours, we can see the graph with the amount of solar that's being generated, the amount of consumption that is being consumed or the amount of power that's being consumed. And the blue line at the top is the state of charge of the batteries. And because we're right in the middle of summer here, the batteries, it looks like they haven't dropped below they didn't drop below 70% in the last 24 hours. We weren't doing anything particularly interesting yesterday in terms of electricity use. So our consumption was only 4.4 kilowatt hours and the production was 5.6. And the production is always gonna be slightly more than the consumption because of losses and inefficiencies. Um, but it's also never gonna be like insanely high. I mentioned earlier that we've got 2.4 kilowatts of solar panels. And so we could potentially generate 24 kilowatt hours of power in a day because we get 10 hours of sun in the, in the middle of summer. But we can only ever produce what we can store or consume in any given period. Whilst we're talking data, we can talk about lifetime usage and production because that might be interesting. Let's have a quick look here. So in the last 30 days, we have consumed 173 kilowatt hours and we've produced 226. So that averages out at 5.8 kilowatt hours consumption per day and 7.5 kilowatt hours production per day over that 30 day period. Uh, I think one of the fridges is also working overtime as well because it's in the shed, which gets very, very hot and it's a very old fridge. In fact, we inherited it with the property, so it doesn't seal very well. And I think it's on pretty much all the time. And so I think that's artificially inflating our numbers at the moment. Yeah. Um, one thing I did want to look at was just lifetime usage. So there we go. Uh, total consumption in the lifetime of the usage of the system, uh, 1,860 kilowatt hours and production of 2,489. Quite interesting. And you can see that kind of weird blue spike in the middle. That is uh, December and January 2021-22 when we weren't here. So that's why the batteries were almost constantly full at that time because we basically turned everything off. We were running like five watts for a router or something. I think that's probably enough of all of this stuff. If you have questions about it, whether they're technical questions or kind of lifestyle questions, do let us know and we'll do our best to answer them. But I think it'll be interesting to wrap up with some of our future plans for our solar system. So this is our house <laughs> and these are our outbuildings and both of those need electricity. At some point, this will not look like this wreck that it is. <laughs> um, and so we've gone backwards and forwards many times on where to site our solar equipment. And we've just recently, we think we finalized the plan, which is to build a little solar shed or services shed right here where the water is. Um, so that the main line from the panels can come into here and then we can take a feed in either direction to both of the sets of buildings. So we're hoping Q4 this year to build this shed and also to build a new structure for the panels down there. But effectively all of the gear that was in our kitchen shed will come and be here and then we will run a power line into the house and eventually a power line into there does mean more digging yes mm -hmm. yes because we love digging and we will be building this to allow for expansion so we'll just be moving our existing gear into this service cupboard um, but we will allow for another battery bank and potentially a second inverter or bigger inverter because we know we're going to need to generate more power so yeah you can look forward to that project hopefully later this year before it gets too cold and wet. Um, but let's go and talk about the plans for where the panels are going to go, because that's also interesting. So the plan for the structure that we've just been talking about is not to build it out of wood like the existing solar shed and the existing water closet, which is down there. 
but make more of a kind of traditional masonry like structure with a tiled roof and block walls and we've got some plans in the future to do some building with hemp blocks and so we're going to use this as an opportunity to do like a small scale experiment or a test drive to see if we can source hemp blocks or if we do like poured in place hempcrete uh, and a few other things surrounding how all of that works. So that will be quite an interesting project, something that we're kind of in research mode on at the moment, um, but something to look forward to if you like that kind of stuff as well. We've stopped just here to talk about the new location of the solar panels, which is quite similar to the existing location, but a little bit different. You're gonna this, dance for me. <laughs> this big space here, uh, minus a few of these little trees, will become a large pergola style carport with a slight storage shed on it and then on top of that we will put our panels and the idea is the six that we have plus some additional ones and the ones we're looking at are now 500 watts which i think they're actually 600 now <laughs> every time we look they're a different size so we will get the biggest panels that we can in terms of wattage and there will still be some space on the ground if we want to then additionally put some we also have an idea for another like garden shed uh, down there are tanks and we could put a couple up on there and run a dc system for all our pumps and all that kind of stuff as well i don't think we're going to get to this carport this year um, but very early next year it's probably the first thing on our list to get our panels off the ground and onto the carport and also because we need some storage space so we can keep working on the house. Yeah, so the plan is to build it pretty much where we're standing and to orient it due south so all the panels can point in one direction rather than the kind of around a semicircle that we've got at the moment, which is not the ideal situation. We want them all facing south to capture the most sun during the peak of the day. So we'll have to play around a little bit in terms of where we're gonna site this thing exactly, but also so that we can drive the cars in and park them both underneath and have access to all the storage and all that kind of stuff. As part of this expansion, we'll have to add in a second charge controller so that we've got capacity for those additional panels. And so we'll be running two charge controllers, one large battery bank, which probably will increase in size. And we may have to add a second inverter or we may have to get a slightly bigger inverter to handle the potentially increased load of running multiple things concurrently inside the house. But we'll see how we go with that. The beauty of this system is that it is modular and scalable. So we've got lots of options in terms of how we want to go about doing that. So there we go. I think that covers most of the things that uh, people have been asking about. We'll consolidate some of this information and we'll put some links in the description in case you want to go into more detail with this stuff. And I think a useful way to kind of wrap this up in a one-liner is to essentially ask the question, are we happy with this system and does it work for us? Which is a resounding yes. And in fact, on a day-to-day -day basis, it doesn't feel any different having this off-grid solar setup to having regular power from the mains grid. We've got sockets on the wall, we plug stuff in, we use it without really thinking about it too much. And whilst we have made some adjustments to our lifestyle, really we're just a bit more aware of the things that we're using, the power that we're consuming. Um, but it's nice to know that it's all coming from the sun up there because we've got plenty of that here in Portugal. And so it's a really good option for us. Anyway, I think that is enough for now. Thank you for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Ciao.